morning everyone i can see that the number of participants is still going up but i think we should start i think it's important to try and keep us to time um and lovely to see so many uh faces on my screen today uh morning to everybody my name is uh, faith gibson and i am privileged to work at the university of surrey alongside ronjana and paul uh who this is their day really i'm just uh chairing the session for them um i'm a professor of child health and cancer care and um, yeah, delighted to be here today. So I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping while those participant numbers are still coming in and say a little bit about the program and then um, hand you over to the speakers. Actually, the participant numbers are still flashing up a little bit. So I'm going to wait a minute or two just while they're coming in. OK, so welcome, everybody. Um, so a tiny bit of housekeeping before we start to say that we will be recording today. And I hope that's OK by everybody we have here. Uh, we have a number of different speakers, so there'll be a bit of moving between uh, switching screens, which, of course, we are massively efficient at now in the world that we find ourselves in. Um, I would ask you to keep yourself muted uh, while uh, there are presentations. And if you have any questions, just post them in the chat box and I will pick those up. There's a Q&A at the end and it's going to be easier for me to probably direct some of those questions. So if you could put those in the chat box, that would be um, great. Um, and um, I'm never quite sure about the switching off your video or leaving it on through the talks. Um, I, I, I don't know what people uh, prefer who were speaking. It's nice to see people. Um, but also um, it can be a bit of a distractor. So I think we'll go for switching your videos off and but definitely making sure that you're uh, muted would be incredibly uh, helpful. Um, hopefully, um, oh, numbers are still going up. And um, there was a few slides at the beginning, just as people were joining us in terms of this is the book launch and some of the things. So maybe it's what we'll do is we'll put those slides up at the end again, I think, so that everybody gets that information. So, um, up to 32 now. Well, fabulous. So many people are joining us today uh, for this book launch on a really important day, which is the International Day for Mental Health in Fathers. And in fact, I just went on to um, the website to look at that. It's going to be an incredibly busy day for all those people, including Andy, who is one of our speakers today. I can see there's lots of things that are planned, but we're here today to talk about a fabulous new book. Um, and um, I think what I'm going to do is hand you over straight away to Paul, who's a reader in sociology uh, here at the University of Surrey, and Ranjana, who's a reader, reader in media and communication. They're going to kick us off in terms of telling us a little bit about their book. Um, and then we have uh, three speakers, one of which is by video uh, and the other two are live in all senses of the word. Um, but I think we can probably I'll do um, introductions before the talks, I think, probably. Uh, Paul and Ranjana, are you happy to... Um, to kick off great okay i'm going to leave it over to you and as i say um we're now up to 33 so welcome everybody if you've just joined us nice to see you all thank you thanks so much uh faith and thank you so much for chairing this for us we're sort of delighted to have you for this um and also to andy britta and jez um for speaking we are um particularly sort of delighted because I, th I think we sort of see this book hopefully as sort of cutting across sort of disciplines and subject areas and so on and uh it also we hope sort of speaks to both sort of academic understandings and, and hopefully also to sort of practice as, as well and sort of what we can sort of do to, to support and, and help various of the issues that, that we're sort of raising in the book. So yeah, we're really sort of delighted to have such an end, excellent and uh, diverse panel of speakers. And also uh, thanks to everybody for joining us as well. It's, it's brilliant to have so many people and, and just looking around, I, I think probably also from a range of different sort of backgrounds and, and disciplines and so on. Um, we are also really proud to have this launch as sort of part of the uh, excellent International Father's Mental Health Day, uh, which takes place every year the day after Father's Day. Um, and really grateful to have the support of its organisers, including Andy, who's here today and, and will be talking uh, in a moment. Uh, we wanted to thank most of all, though, um, the 15 fathers who gave up significant amounts of time and energy um, to tell us in real detail about the, the sometimes sort of incredibly detailed, sorry, incredibly difficult experiences and emotions that they experienced after having a baby. So why fathers? Uh, Paul and I came together to research fathers' mental health um, 
uh, from a couple of different angles, I suppose. So Paul was already uh, researching fathers uh, with our colleague Rachel Brooks, uh, focusing on fathers and caregiving, so fathers who are shared uh, equal or uh, primary carers of their children. And in parallel, I had been researching mothers uh, and mothers' mental health in uh, the context of uh, the role of digital technologies. So we converged those interests and, um, you know, and suddenly we have this new project on fathers uh, and, and, and mental health and, and new technologies. But also we approached this project from uh, interesting personal points uh, of view because we both sort of experienced the uh, first hand the difficulties and struggles and challenges that becoming a new parent can involve. And we were really interested in learning a little bit more about the experiences and perspectives of those dads that do struggle. Um, and our emphasis was on in-depth, rich, qualitative accounts and on particularly on how society positions new fathers and how that positioning can shape the kinds of challenges they can face. And particularly also, we emphasized the role of digital technologies in the process in terms of how it might shape the ways in which new dads feel prepared, unprepared, able to be supported, able to support, able to cope or not. And we were interested in the role of digital technologies in their broader lives and mental health journeys. Okay, so we thought we'd just sort of take you through uh, some of the, we, we hope, sort of interesting, useful, um, sort of main findings to come out of the book. Uh, and I'm going to start just by saying a little bit about the, the kinds of circumstances and struggles that the fathers described. So uh, fathers reported a range of, of different sort of, sort of conditions, experiences. Some of them used sort of quite medical sort of terminology and sort of talked about sort of diagnoses and so on. Others just sort of described sort of broader experiences. So we, quite a lot of mentions of depression, probably even more of anxiety, but also sort of more specific things, trauma, OCD sometimes, and, and a number of other sort of um, connections things too. Um, in terms of contributing factors, the kind of context in which fathers felt that they, they had begun to, to struggle, um, there were sort of maybe sort of two categories really. So, so sometimes there were particular things that had gone wrong or had become challenging. So for example, pregnancies that had become difficult in one way or another births that had become traumatic. Um, sometimes uh, the, the mother had developed sort of mental health difficulties of her own and then that had sort of had a sort of knock-on effect on, on the father's mental health too. So sometimes quite specific things of, uh, of that kind and, and other kinds, um, but also quite a lot of talk among the fathers of, of perhaps more expected kind of everyday stuff. Um, so sleeplessness, crying, adjusting to sort of this kind of um, real sort of high pressure juggling of responsibilities. Um, some talked also about the overall impact on their identity, that they hadn't sort of felt prepared for the extent of the change in who they were and, and what was expected of them and, and what their position in, in society and, and in relation to their family now was. Um, bonding issues, uh, some talking about social isolation um, from, from friends and so on and that kind of change. So overall, sort of putting these sort of various things together, and for many of them, it actually was a combination of different things that they felt had led to things. We have sort of drawn on um, Barry, who sort of quite famously in relation to health more generally talks about biographical disruption, sort of periods of biographical disruption. And we want to sort of try and think of the perinatal period, the, the period of sort of having a baby as being one that quite frequently is, is a period of biographical disruption. Um, so amidst the, the various sort of fulfillment and joy that might take place, a wide range of challenges and difficulties are likely to be encountered. And in light of this, I suppose we want in the book really to sort of think of father's mental health difficulties as being not really surprising if you think about what's actually involved in the process of having a baby. So in the context of these unsurprising difficulties, if, if we sort of begin to understand that, okay, it's quite normal and, and, and natural for, for uh, people to struggle in, in, in that part of life, what we found particularly uh, captivating throughout this project was the struggles in actually recognizing, recognizing that, communicating about that and seeking support. And that's where our research sort of came in. So we found, first of all, that there was a genuine difficulty that these fathers experienced in actually recognizing their struggles as struggles, uh, recognizing the difficulties as actual things that deserve support, that are worthy of support. And this we found came from a range of different areas. So one was a lack of knowledge and preparation and information. 
So whilst a lot of information was geared towards mothers being prepared for the, for the birth, for the labor, for postnatal mental health uh, difficulties and so on, uh, many fathers found themselves quite surprised actually to be struggling. Uh, and, and that came from a place of sort of lack of preparation and awareness and information beyond the actual birth or having the baby uh, itself. But we also found even when once identified, fathers then struggle to actually recognize their difficulties as at all valid. And we, in our book, we, we talk about this at length and we call it repertoires of illegitimacy because repeatedly in the interviews, these men positioned their difficulties as illegitimate, not valid, invalid, undeserving of support, unworthy of support, resulting in many spirals of self-blame and feelings of failure because the broad understanding was we might be struggling, but it's not really a thing really because the focus should be. Uh, elsewhere. And we talk about these repertoires of illegitimacy in our book where fathers consistently in the interviews we find script their difficulties as inappropriate and invalid. And this then becomes a significant barrier to communicating about these difficulties because you haven't recognized them in the first place, resulting in spirals of guilt. Okay, so sort of digging a bit deeper then, we sort of try to sort of, um, I suppose, to, to, to explain where these sort of um, feelings of illegitimacy in terms of people's um, uh, mental health struggles come from. And there are a number of different factors, but we sort of zeroed in on, on some in particular. Um, firstly, uh, I think Ranjana already mentioned sort of a general um, deficit really in, in the information and preparation that, that are provided um, for, for new fathers on their way through the perinatal process. So many of them weren't aware that, that that mental health struggles for new fathers was a sort of recognized thing that, that can happen. And they weren't aware either what kinds of things they could do potentially to deal with such struggles when they emerge. So that clearly is a sort of area of sort of practical attention that's needed. We also, though, looked at the broader way in which fathers are positioned and the ways in which that could sort of affect the, the way in which they might respond to um, struggles of the kind that we were interested in. And um, this broader positioning kind, kind of reflects the whole of society, really, the way the whole of society positions what a new father is and what a new father's for and what can be expected of new fathers. So it might be family, it might be peers, it might be media representations of one kind or another. It might be institutions that they come across um, during the perinatal process that, that are sort of supporting um, them or, or their partner. And there are two ways in which we think fathers are positioned, which kind of lead to difficulties um, in, in recognizing problems as legitimate ones. Um, firstly, many of the fathers talked about feeling sort of peripheral to the process, feeling a little bit sort of marginal on the edge of the process in the role of supporter, if you like. Um, so a supporter of their partner, observing, encouraging, helping from the sidelines, but in this kind of sort of odd kind of in-between position. So, so you're not like a visitor, you're more important than that, for example. Um, you're, you're clearly invited in, you're part of what's going on, but, but nevertheless it's not position is sort of primarily about you and and you're sort of primarily on the sidelines in the supporter role we think that's sort of quite important fathers feeling like it's not really about them almost is kind of connected with some of those feelings that their 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 mental health struggles might not be legitimate or valid that they might not feel that it's legitimate that they should seek su support when the focus of attention should be on their partner for example Secondly, the, this kind of supporter role, this positioning of fathers as supporter links to quite strongly felt expectations of sort of masculine rock-like stoicism, that, that the father should ultimately be sort of this rock of support for his partner and should offer sort of um, kind of limitless one directional support and should not require support himself as part of that. And the failure or what feels like a failure for some of the fathers to provide that sort of one directional support without needing support himself can feel like a significant um, failure, a, a significant thing that induces spirals of guilt and, and everything else. Importantly, I think we feel like that masculinity in general is important here. So, so I probably people are uh, familiar that masculinity in general is connected with the difficulties to reach out for support for mental health difficulties. So that's true partly, but we also think there are very particular sets of expectations during this perinatal period that, that, that sort of make that worse, if you like. 
So within that broader context of the, of, of the societal shaping of people's experiences and the broader structural factors at play in, in terms of masculinities in general, but also the perinatal period in particular, we were interested in how people inform themselves, how they support themselves and each other, how they cope. And needless to say, all of that happens in a mediated world, in a world where digital media technologies are firmly embedded into our lives. So we went into this process with a bit of an open mind in terms of finding out really what role does that play. Um, and we wanted to kind of stay away from too much hope and hype around technology. And what we found actually was complicated and nuanced as we would expect. And we identify in our book uh, what we call a spectrum of engagement where we found sort of different modes of engagement with the digital as part of people's coping journeys. Now, one of the really key things about the idea of the spectrum is that it's not watertight categories where we can say one father was one kind of user throughout his own mental health journey and another person was another kind of user. That could well be the case, but largely we saw fluidity. We saw movement. Sometimes people would do this and sometimes people would do that. And that entirety, that, that entire spectrum is what we uh, try to grasp in our book. And just some of the examples from the spectrum. I mean, on the one hand, we had people who were uh, sort of engaging in online activism, uh, proper fulsome uh, communication to lots and lots of people, raising awareness, offering support, doing a lot of work online. We sometimes had people who were not doing that, but who were making fairly public and broad and open disclosures about their difficulties on social media. Then we had uh, some really interesting uh, sort of tentative and doubtful acts where people would sort of, you know, with, with a lot of doubt and hesitation, kind of indicate that they are having difficulties. And Paul is going to talk about that later. Sometimes we had people completely disconnecting sometimes mass defriending, sometimes just lurking and never saying a single word. And those aspects of the spectrum we found really interesting. So disconnection itself, uh, as, as broader scholarship in the field is currently showing, was very interesting to us. And sometimes people would sort of read and learn and listen. So all of these things were part of that spectrum. But the, but the key finding that we, that we argue uh, really in our book is that these little things, that uh, other uh, colleagues of ours in the field have called small acts of engagement. We argue that those small acts are really important. They might not matter to others so much, but that small act of lurking somewhere, making one post, retweeting something, liking something, those acts might have a lot of meaning for somebody in their own coping journeys. One little Google search, one little share somewhere, might be somebody just recognizing and validating their struggles and experiences. So these acts can be symbolically important. You know, Google searches, joining a forum, but not posting lots or just liking someone's post or liking someone's blog. They need not be big grand digital acts, but they still matter, we argue. And we argue that such acts have this potential for people sort of agentic participation for people to recognize their struggles, to begin communicating. And they also draw attention to the sort of the ongoing nature of father struggles and the complicated way in which uh, digital media and technologies fit in into their journeys. Okay, so a particularly um, what we found sort of interesting, sort of striking example of, of, of some of what Ranjana is talking about is, is what we call sort of effective coding, which we use really to sort of describe kind of hidden or semi-hidden um, messages from fathers um, where they're kind of disclosing something but without that that being obvious in a kind of hidden or coded way if you like so there's all of this feeling which is kind of going into this this quite hidden act actually which many people might not even notice possibly so we, we sort of um, noticed that many of the fathers in their accounts, it, it was really clear that they were quite keen, or almost desperate sometimes to communicate with people about their struggles, um, but often felt unable to do so in sort of open ways. And, and sometimes, you know, particularly with people that they knew because that they, that they felt that it would just sort of shatter expectations and, and, and it was just sort of too difficult because of these repertoires of illegitimacy that they were struggling from. So some of them use digital media, use some of the things that you can do with digital media, I guess, to, to make these kind of emotionally dense yet coded forms of disclosure about their mental health struggles. 
um, telling people without telling them, reaching out for help in the most sort of tentative and semi-visible of ways. And there were a few sort of different examples of this kind of across the, the, the group of, of men that we spoke to. Um, so uh, one example was sort of coded references to things as part of just sort of writing a, an update on, on Facebook, say. Um, so posting about feeling better today, for example, as a kind of coded and way of sort of referring to, to less good um, previous days or possibly following days. Um, could be liking or sharing posts on mental health uh, without perhaps any comment whatsoever in order that somebody might wonder why this person has shared that and whether that has anything to do with something that they might be going through uh, and, and, and sort of reaches out to them. So these posts, as Ranjana was saying, sort of in some ways small, sort of almost barely visible, they wouldn't sort of come up in a sort of, if we'd done a study of online content, we probably wouldn't have spotted some of these kind of things, I don't think. But they're effectively and symbolically crucial as moments in which fathers have just sort of made that small sort of tentative attempt to sort of reach out a little bit. Although on the, on the more negative side, there is of course no guarantee that such coded messages result in the support that is hoped for. So that was one of the examples of one of the points in the spectrum where people might sort of not leave digital footprints that you can scrape online uh, using your big data approaches, but rather that you really hear about when you talk to people about their, about, about their navigation of content or their behavior online. And that really le uh, led us in the book to think about the broader networks of uh, relationships and connections in people's lives and the role of technology there. So as these people sort of negotiated their mental health difficulties and went through that period of biographical disruption, some of them made new connections. Sometimes they were on online anonymous forums. Sometimes they were on sort of shared interest, closed parents groups. Sometimes they um, sort of used technologies to communicate with existing friends and family. And we found that everybody had this sort of a tapestry of intimacies, as we call it in the book, a, a network uh, of, of loads of different kinds of connections involving to some extent uh, the role of digital media and technology in one way or another. So for example, uh, we had fathers who, who who might use something like Facebook Messenger to 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 communicate something really difficult or really uh, something that they couldn't communicate face to face with a close household member. Uh, someone who was able to uh, who felt able to use WhatsApp to make a bit of a big disclosure to extended family or parents. Uh, again, because a face to face a conversation felt difficult. So even with existing relationships, then as part of their mental health coping journeys. Uh, uh, digital technologies came to be used in really uh, interesting ways. And, and, and sometimes with newer people, these would develop in other online settings, or sometimes these would become face-to-face -face contacts. But broadly, if you think about an individual and their whole world and their whole context as a bit of a tapestry of connections, we found that as a part of people's journeys, these were all sort of mediated to one way or another. Okay, and then just sort of briefly to sort of round off by, by sort of looking forwards, really, um, we are sort of more than aware that this is a, a very sort of fast moving area, really, with new research coming out and also new developments in sort of practice and policy. And, and you know, we've been sort of really sort of encouraged by, by various sort of new sort of initiatives and improvements over the last sort of um, few years, really, in this area, albeit that there's still a lot to do. And we're currently involved in a, a project that we're really excited by uh, with the Institute of Health Visiting and the National Childbirth Trust um, to try to sort of turn some of our research fundings really and in, into support for both fathers and mothers involving some research that Ranjana also has done on, on sort of mothers and mental health in the past and that includes today actually not only are we <laughs> launching this book but we're also launching three factor graphics with the Institute of Health Visiting um, oriented towards different sort of areas of, of need as we see it and, and, and they do um, to try and support um, new parents um, well-being. And without going into sort of too much um, specifics, our findings we think and hope have, have various broader implications for policy and practice. Um, I'll just sort of mention a, a few examples really rather than going into super detail. So clearly the research highlights as various other people have the need to sort of inform and prepare fathers as much as we possibly can for possible mental health challenges that, that they might experience. And also frankly, the sort of variety of other aspects of the process of having a baby that could be difficult or challenging. 
Um, we need to also ensure, of course, that fathers are given opportunities to disclose um, difficulties. So it isn't all, the onus isn't always on them to go out and sort of find support, but that sometimes they might be asked whether they're okay, whether they're suffering from any difficulties at different points during the process. And in a broader sense, thinking about some of the things that we said about how new fathers are positioned more generally, we feel like it's, it's really important to do more to ensure fathers are included as full participants in the perinatal process in order to tackle some of those feelings of peripherality and, and also the notion that their feelings and, and, and experiences might not be entirely sort of legitimate. Um, we also need to sort of challenge quite openly, I think, some of the more damaging discourses around new fatherhood, around sort of paternal stoicism and rock-like support and so on, and the difficulties that they can lead to. And on the digital stuff specifically, um, a range of different things we talk about in the book, but, but we, we feel there is sort of much potential for the development of new resources that might take advantage of the affordances of online communication. And again, we're sort of aware that even as we speak, new such resources are sort of gradually sort of emerging, but also making fathers aware of the existence and potential of, of existing resources which already are out there for them um, and that they might not be aware of. Um, having said that, I suppose end with a note of, note of caution, I, I think we're sort of more than aware also that digital communications ought not to be seen as some sort of a magical solution, as, as Ranjana said. Um, the experiences of the fathers in the study were sometimes very positive in relation to digital media, but, but quite often they were quite complicated, uneven. Um, you know, a, a lot of sort of tentative stuff going on. And of course, there's a much broader set of um, issues that, that we're dealing with here, here as well as the digital media. So we need to sort of tackle things on all of those bases, we think. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ranjana and Paul. And um, I just want to say one thing is whenever I hear you talk, um, the bit um, I, I so love to hear is already you're making that link into practice, the fact graphics, the working with the health visitors. So it's um, it's qualitative research moving into practice at its very best. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for that. So there's a couple of things I just want to point out that one, the chat function is there for you to post your questions and we will uh, refer to those in the Q&A at the end. Uh, Grace is kindly beavering away in the background and she's given you all the codes that you need for uh, to, to buy the book. So there's discount codes and she's putting them all in the, the chat. So thank you, Grace, for keeping up with um, with that. Um, and I just a quick question, the factor graphics, well, where will they be? Do, do we need to make sure people know where to find those, Ranjana? So the fractal graphics are being launched as we speak. I think two of them have already been launched, the one on new fathers and the one uh, on uh, new parenthood during the pandemic. Uh, they will be on the Institute of Health Visiting's website. But if you're on Twitter, if you look at either mine or Paul's profiles or the Institute of Health Visiting's profile, the links are being constantly tweeted out all day today. But we are also happy to perhaps put the fractal graphics links in the chat, if that's okay with you, Paul. Thank you. I just think they're a great example. Um, I'm going to um, thank you both. I'm going to move on um, to our first uh, speaker, and that's An Andy Mayers, who is a academic psychology psychologist. He's based in Bournemouth uh, University, and he specialises in mental health, particularly in that perinatal period, which is what we're focusing on today. Um, and we've already heard he's instrumental in supporting and leading on the um, International Fathers Mental Health Day. And I made the mistake of just pressing print when I went onto Andy's profile and managed to print out all of his reference. So he really is a true academic with a prolific profile of work. So thank you very much, Andy. You've pointed me to lots of things I should be reading. Um, and Andy's going to talk to us for about um, 20 minutes, I think. Isn't that right, Andy? And I'm handing the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much. That's a lovely introduction. Um, everyone 20 minutes maybe I, I will try and keep it a tad shorter than that because i know we've got other speakers here today but yes indeed i, I mean, the day job i'm an, a psychologist at bournemouth university where i do specialize in mental health particularly perinatal mental health that's been my area of focus particularly mums but getting on for the last 20 years and it's only really in the last six or seven years that we've been looking at fathers too, because it started becoming obvious, despite the fact that I'm a father and a grandfather, it didn't dawn on me that fathers also needed help. So this is beginning to happen, and this is why 
I'm here today and I'll speak a little bit more about what I've done briefly in a moment, but I just want to go back to this whole thing about what we're here for to today in terms of it is International Father's Mental Health Day. This is something that's been running for about seven years or so. My good friend Mark Williams started that along with uh, Daniel Singley in the USA. And for about the last five years or so, I've been the co-host for the UK alongside Mark. Um, and it's growing. I mean, I, just before we came on here, maybe half an hour or so ago, I checked the Twitter infographics, uh, it, uh, analytics rather, and they were telling me that we've hit over 4 million Twitter impressions already, which is pretty good for about half past 10 in the morning on the first day. So the, the idea of the day is to raise that awareness, have events like this, release videos and blogs and resources, actually uh, overcoming some of the very things that both Paul and Ranjana have been talking about. Now, as well as being an academic, I do do a great deal of research, and we can talk about that briefly in a moment. Um, my role is to campaign um, and get to the very heart of the matter to try and persuade those people, the governments and, um, and NHS and commissioners and all of those to try and make those changes, a real change. Uh, so, we, and we'll come back to that as well. But essentially, if we're looking at the fathers, some of this kind of uh, captures what has been said already. And, and the main areas of my focus with fathers and their mental health, and certainly in terms of the research, has been several things. First of all, the extent to which we need to be able to give that information, support, uh, guidance, toolkit to fathers to support their own partner, should she be experiencing mental health problems uh, in the perinatal period. We know full well that one of the major factors of women developing postnatal or even perinatal uh, mental illnesses is whether or not they get that support from their partner and that's not through any fault of their own it's just there hasn't been any information out there about how they can support so we've been doing some work on that that is actually currently published in bmc pregnancy and childbirth another thing that i wanted to look at was what kind of support and information do we need to get give to fathers about their own mental health? Now, we, I'll explore some of those factors in a moment because it got picked up very nicely. But fathers can develop mental health problems, maybe because their partner has experienced these problems, but they can develop these problems independently themselves as well. So what information and support do we need, need to give them? Uh, that has just been accepted for publication, but not recently enough for it, or rather the, the information isn't quite online yet because they're still going through the briefing stage, but you'll be able to see that very soon. The, the final piece of work that we've done in terms of research that is published was fathers who maybe witness their partner's birth trauma. They're in that room, in the birthing room. You know, fathers are there more, more so now than they have been it, you know, throughout history, 90 odd percent, probably almost all fathers are now in that birthing room. So they could potentially be in that room when things go horribly wrong and they're potentially witnessing their partner and or child get into very serious trouble. What kind of support, information, guidance do we give fathers in those contexts? Now, we haven't got time to go through all the things that I did find, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that we've done and it kind of draws on a lot of stuff that Ranjana and Paul were saying. So I'm here today for a number of reasons. First of all, um, it was, you know, I've got a book with me here, a great book. And, and it's, um, it's a, it was an honor to, in, to endorse that book. Um, and I'm really delighted that we've included the launch of this book as part of the, one of the key events for today. Because for me, what this does in a very succinct and clear um, way, in, and certainly in ways that I've not seen before, to add to that growing evidence and information that we have for fatherless mental health. So that's brilliant. 
Now, the few things that I'd like to cover here, I think, I want to pick up on one of the points that uh, both Paul and Ranjana were mentioning, partly because Steve Roberts was going to talk about this and he wasn't able to do uh, to join us, and that's to do with masculinity. And also I want to focus on the bits that were said at the end there about how we can actually take this forward into policy and practice. And these are two very different things. So just thinking about the masculinity for a moment, there are many, many factors that can cause fathers to encounter difficulties uh, with their own mental health during the perinatal period. But one of them is most certainly masculinity. And I think this book covers that really well, because for me, it could be one of those things that kind of define the starting point for the problems that the father is, is potentially experiencing. Some of the things that I mentioned, it was it was mentioned earlier, um, but I'll, I'll go over it again. Some of the things that are explored in terms of the research is the way in which men talk about emotions or rather don't talk about emotions and therefore don't seek the help because of perhaps being invalid or perhaps because they just don't do that sort of thing. Um, you know, and we, we heard about some of those examples earlier. But some of the things that really stood out for me in the research that was cited in, particularly in chapter two of this book, was the way in which um, men typically have small um, social networks. Even if they do have those networks, the, the emphasis is far less on emotional support than we might see in, say, women's um, similar type groups. And when men encounter uh, emotion or emotional challenges, they're far more likely, the evidence suggests, to want to just keep that control, to hide the actual emotionality of it, hide the feelings, if you like, to stay independent, to stay strong, silent and tough. These are some of the things that we, we heard earlier. But we is there is some evidence beginning to grow that men could be more willing to be open about these things if they had these conversations with other men in, in whichever way that needs to be done we can come back to that but one of the things that was also very clear to me in in the opening of of the book was that uh, you know that men are more likely to communicate in action than that they are words so in, they will typically do things to try and mend things to make things right rather than actually talk about and I think that's something that we need to really work on. And also, I think, for me, all of that then set the scene for what the book tried to do in terms of where those problems lie, how we could start overcoming them, perhaps the way in which we can use di digital technologies, online resources, and that sort of thing. But just to pick up on some of that masculinity, to reinforce it with some of my own research, in all three of those papers that have been or are about to be published in BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth, there was a common theme. Men felt they were the rock. They didn't want to let the side down. Some of the chaps were telling me, I can't go to work and talk about this because that's not what chaps do. And in fact, some of them actually felt that they were then almost alienated by their, their male colleagues for even talking about that they simply didn't want to express their emotions. And even when they did feel um, any sort of element of emotion, they felt intensely guilty. And I think things are beginning to change, partly because we're having these conversations, partly because of days like today, partly because there's research going out there. Um, you might have seen um, towards the end of last week and over the weekend, the BBC um, published um, or, or did a story on the, on their website from um, a chap called Elliot, who's uh, part of um, music, football and fatherhood. And it was a very frank story that he told about his experience of uh, encountering uh, trauma with the birth of one of his children. Really good story, really powerful, some great links in there uh, about uh, all the things that have been done fantastic and yet despite that honesty despite the way in which he said it the comments online started coming in to say what are you doing this for you know 
you should just man up. You should be the rock. Why are you even having this conversation? That I think they took the comments offline because they, they, they became so distasteful, I think. But I think what that really does tell us is men are beginning to talk about these things, and yet there's still that stigma within society that we need to tackle to re-educate, to make sure that, you know, um, we start doing this. And I think one of the things that this book does really well is about the way in which we should be challenging that, the way in which we should reposition the way men think and the way we, we could encourage them to do that. So that's what I wanted to say about some of the, the bounding them in terms of the masculinity, if you like, that underpins perhaps one of the reasons why men feel this way, dads feel this way. The other bit I wanted to talk about was this whole thing about future policy and practice. And I picked out some of the, the headlines of the results and Paul and Rangjana have done this in any case. But I think one of the things that came out of the results very clearly was about the fathers, the way in which they struggled to even see their identity in terms of their emo emotionality, their masculinity, the role, the gender role, the challenges that have, and all those things that we mentioned. And of course that does and uh, continues to have an impact on the, the way in which they seek help. And one of the key things that came out, and I've seen this again and, and again and again, is the information simply isn't there in the first place. So fathers, until relatively recently, had absolutely no idea what they could do, what resources are there, where is that support? So the obvious conclusion is that we need to change the way that we do things. We need changes in policy and changes in practice. Now, we kind of heard a little bit about the practice uh, and Faith picked up on this as well, like these resources um, that are going on the Institute of Health Visiting website and what have you. And that's great. This is a change in the way, perhaps the way that we deliver these things. But we also need a change in policy. We also need at the very heart of our NH systems and everything else through our midwifery, through our health visiting, through um, obstetricians, anyone who's involved in the perinatal period, we need to fundamentally change our policy towards the way in which we um, support fathers in addition to the mothers. It's never instead of, it's in addition. I think one of the key things that we need to do is we need to make sure that new fathers are made aware of the, the possibility that it, this can actually happen. And it was kind of picked up on, I think it was Paul that said it, that, you know, um, that has absolutely no idea that this experience could happen to them. And we need to be able to manage those expectations in fathers to say, yeah, you know what, this could happen, be aware of that. But if it does happen, this is what you can do. And we need to do a lot more of that. And again, my own research has picked up, up, up again and again, where they, the fathers were saying to us, I had no idea that this could happen to my wife. I had no idea this could happen to me. I had no idea that birth could be traumatic. We need to manage that expectation without scaring people to the expense so that they're ready, if you like, and then can engage in those resources once they do realise that maybe that's the kind of thing that could happen. So we need to change the way in which we have our antenatal courses. Paul mentioned earlier about the NCT. Great, they do some wonderful antenatal courses. We need to embed the fathers into those courses, into midwifery, into all the other resources that are online, all of those things. And I think that one of the things that book does really well is refer to some of the changes that have already been made. Um, the only thing I would say, it, 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 there, there's a mention in the book about the way in which um, fathers are supported in the UK. Actually, it's only in England. When NHS England made those announcements about the changes to fathers' mental health, about screening fathers for their mental health, that applied to England. It didn't apply to Scotland. It didn't play, apply to Wales. It didn't ap apply to Northern Ireland. And we need to work on that. Um, come back to that in a moment, if you like. Um, also, um, I think 
one of the things to really reinforce here, and I meant to, meant, meant to mention this earlier, so I'll bring it in now. You know, these events are great. These, the book's great. Our research can do so much. But I hear people say, well, it's not going to make any difference anyway. Well done for making, you know, saying what needs to be done, but it won't make any changes. But it does. Our research, there's a number of people I've seen online on this talk uh, today that were um, alongside myself, informed NHS England about what needs to be done. We gave them the evidence about what needed to be done. They asked us for that. We gave it to them. And they did make those changes to the extent that they said that fathers would now be screened for their mental health. That's a major win. And it was based on research. It was based on the uh, campaigning. It was based on the stuff that we were talking about on social media, on radio programs and so forth. So it really can make a difference. But I think one of the other things that we can do, and it's not just about the NHS, and that's really important. And if we get time, I'll come back to why I applaud what the NHS has done, but it's not enough. Um, we also need to think about the way in which we embed this to healthcare professionals in the perinatal period, um, to charities, to the third sector. We need to make sure that that is always included in that. And it's not just about mentioning that, it's about the language. Now, I'm not a sociologist, I'm a psychologist, but I, even I was picking up some of the sociological things that were being said earlier on. And I think if we change the language, we can change some of the other things too. Because one of the things that I um, guessed in the paper that's about to be published, why are we even using the, the word maternity? You know, we should be using a different word that explores all parents, the partners, the mothers, and I'm not just talking about the fathers. Today, yeah, we, we are talking about the fathers. On another day, I'll be talking about other partners. It could be same-sex partners. It could be transsexual dads. There are many different things that we need to talk about here. But, you know, we need to change that language, the way in which it almost governs the way in which we do that. So that needs to happen. We also need to make sure more information about fathers, not just about what fathers can experience, but also about what where fathers can get the help and about encouraging them to, to get that help and making sure the resources are there, are on the websites. that are on these digital comms. Uh, that are there on these apps that are being developed. We need to make sure that education is there within the NCT classes, within midwifery training, within health visiting training. It's beginning to happen, but we need a, a great deal more of it. We need to make sure it's also in the third sectors, like within the early years centres, to make sure there's greater facilitation for dads. Now, of course, many dads have gone back to work, and this is a problem. So maybe we need to look at ways that are more flexible hours, about more online groups, about reaching dads in a very different way. We also need to make sure that the resources we are developing are much more you know, father specific as well, because we know or we are beginning to know that fathers need information in a very different way to perhaps mothers do. And that's something we're still learning, but we need to make sure those resources are there. So I think to conclude, I think the, um, you know, I, I love this book, I really do. I think it, it challenges the way in which we conceptualize fathers, men, the masculinity, about the gender roles, about being informed, about being included, about the, their ability to seeking help and actually getting that help. And the evidence, it, you know, it really can make a difference, as I said earlier, but it's up, what we need to do going forward from here is to make sure that happens because we can't just have these events. We can't just have the research. We can't just have these books. We need to follow that up and really, really push to make sure that happens. That's all I need to say. I'll take questions in the Q&A section. So over to you, Faith. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes, please. 
Um, thank you for reminding people, Andy. Please do uh, post your questions in the chat. Um, obviously, I don't know everybody in front of me on the screen. I know a couple of people, and I can certainly see uh, one person I know is a midwife. So it'd be great to hear from a, a, a midwife. And when I get a minute, I'm going to look up the definition of maternity. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, Andy. Um, we're going to hand over. We have got a recording next, I think, Ranjana, haven't we, um, from Britta. Um, who is a professor of media studies at the University of Bergen in Norway um, and her focus has really been on the use of um, obviously as you'd imagine from her title uh, media and and that work so Ranjana have you got that as a recording thank you hello everyone my name is Peter Etrana and I am Professor of Media Studies at the University of Bergen in Norway. I'm sorry I could not attend this book launch live and I'm also sorry it could not be a grand physical event and a true celebration of this very important work. Yet I'm very happy that there will be a digital seminar arranged and that lots of scholars and interested readers will have the possibility to discuss this new book. New Fathers, Mental Health and Digital Communication by Ranjana Das and Paul Hodkinson, both of the University of Surrey. I have worked with Ranjana earlier. Um, uh, we have both been very interested in audience yeah. research and in how new digital platforms affect media users. And I have been asked to give a brief comment on this book from the perspective of scholarship on digital communication and media studies. I'm very happy to do so because I believe that this book speaks to some key challenges and key questions in our field and that it shows us some pro promising avenues forward when it comes to methods and theories. And I will try to substantiate that point in this, this brief remark. Of course, many of you who are here today at the book launch are interested in this book for different reasons, because it also speaks to some really important societal challenges that you might be faced with in your lives, in your practice or in your research. If you are interested in uh, digital uh, technologies in the context of mental health, health communication more broadly, uh, the organization of welfare services uh, in the terms of the challenges the pandemic has brought about, and also fatherhood, motherhood and families in society, then this book has really important contributions to make. And the topics I just mentioned are also central to scholars of media studies and digital communication and are certainly worthy of further exploration also in different kinds of media research. However, this book, uh, also beyond those very important topics, speaks to key challenges and uh, key um, topics also on a more theoretical and fundamental methodological level in media and digital communication research. Because for a long time, uh, research in this area has been very interested in sort of exploring the boundaries, the possibilities, the restrictions, the extremes, if you will, of digital communication technologies and what they can do. Uh, we have been really interested with how anyone could start a blog, anyone could have a YouTube channel, anyone could publish their message on TikTok, on various digital platforms and reach grand audiences through these big creative communicative gestures. And that is important and that is can in many cases be wonderful and afford people the possibilities they did not have before. However, we also know that ordinary users rarely do this. Uh, the grand communicative acts are for the few mainly, while people use digital media in a more careful, subtle, small way. And these small acts of engagement, understanding them, theorizing them, researching them, has become uh, an important challenge as we strive to understand the meaning of digital communication for a broad range of users in different contexts. And here I think that this book and the work uh, formally published also in leading journals in our field, such as the article in New Media and Society that Paul and Trajana published on effective coding, they really entered into this um, debate that is emerging about not just what the possibilities are and the restrictions and the boundaries of the platforms are, but how they are actually used on a range, uh, through a range of communicative actions by different users. There is a middle ground here that can often be uh, very um, subtle, uh, very careful, uh, very guarded, 
but still uh, where people do communicate about uh, the challenges they face in their lives and convey their emotions through digital platforms. And this book really paints a very rich and very vivid picture of how that can happen and all of the meaning, the social, the cultural, the communicative meaning embedded in such small acts. For instance, we know that some of the things that people like to do with social media is to share links, to share, say, a news article, post to a website that covers some sort of topic. And uh, we do not know enough about the emotional work that lies behind those small acts of sharing. But this book shows us how new fathers struggling with mental health might um, suddenly post um, a news article uh, might try to reach out, not by stating, I have a problem or help me with my problem, but by uh, carefully trying to turn the collective attention of these platforms and of their community networks in a direction that might also end up with them uh, receiving some form of support and help. It's really important to understand what is happening here, to understand how this communication is perhaps uh, not as um, creative or as bold as those grand communicative acts, but still happening and still extremely important to how digital technologies play into the different challenges that people face in their lives and in our society. This book offers then both theoretical and methodological contributions because it shows us what we can do with concepts such as small acts of engagement and communicative agency. And it shows us how it's possible to do research, qualitative ethnographic research, talking to people, even about a topic that is uh, difficult for so many reasons um, because it is um, uh, difficult to talk about for the researchers and for the respondents alike and because there is secrecy rather than openness surrounding it in our culture. It also shows us how it's possible to do this kind of research even in the middle of a global pandemic and health crisis and it shows us how much rich analysis can come from a relatively small number of interviews but brought to us as readers in a full book format which gives us all of the texture that we truly need to appreciate the kind of effort that has gone into this work. I am extremely impressed with how uh, Paul and Ranjana have been able to uh, both do this fieldwork, this analysis, and actually finish the book project in the middle of a chaotic pandemic uh, that has affected them and affected all of us, also in terms of how we do our research. I'm so happy that the book is now published and I hope that it will reach large audiences in media and digital communication scholarship and beyond. And I have it here on my iPad, the ebook, but I'm looking forward to a time when I can visit Surrey again and have Paul and Ranjana sign uh, a print uh, copy of the book. I hope that you will get to celebrate a little bit, at least locally, and I wish you a successful book launch. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to Brisa for her. Um, nice uh, reflections um, on the uh, book and its position and how it might be used. Um, I guess I just wanted to pick up on one thing. It's interesting that um, this is a book and um, there's been a definite push towards publications, as Andy mentioned uh, in his talk. Um, but actually, I think what we see here is why books are still important, why it brings together so many different things, such as theory, um, methodological uh, and practice and gives you much more than you would ever get from one uh, single paper. So um, as you can probably see from my background, um, I'm an advocate of books. So uh, it's lovely to see that this is uh, with us today. I'm going to move over to Jasmine, who is uh, joining us now with her video on. Um, welcome. Um, and she joins us um, uh, from uh, a fatherhood institute, a long history of engaging with fathers, Again, um, I've been onto the various websites and found lots of information uh, about you, but I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm sure you have a, a lot to say about the book. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. So uh, professionally speaking, fatherhood has been on my mind for about, uh, well, over 20 years now. Uh, first off, engaging fathers directly uh, and then in my role at the Fatherhood Institute, supporting practitioners and practice to engage with fathers. 
But personally speaking, it's never left my mind, not since the day my dad first held his bright yellow newborn, or when my daughters were held by their fathers, or when my grandson was uh, held in the womb by his father. What fathers do, uh, what my father did, what my daughter's fathers do, matters, and how he is matters. And this weekend, as millions of fathers receive cards and engraved tankards and key rings, fatherhood is high up in the public consciousness, even though we still see the familiar tropes of dad jokes, not as good as mom cards or my second favourite parent cards. They still abound. It does give us a chance to just sit and reflect a little, which is what I've uh, been doing with this book. I wish this chance would stay here for a bit longer. I wish we had more space to think about fatherhood more often in ways that really matter. Um, kind of create spaces for us all to sit and think about this, reflect, acknowledge, then gather up our cards and go out and do something. I am grateful for a job where I can do this uh, and for this incredibly valuable book and for International Father's Mental Health Day and for this opportunity today. So traditionally, parenting research and practice in health and family services has largely ignored fathers, uh, neither considering their influence on child development, nor controlling for their influence when looking at them, uh, the influence of mothers. And two ex possible explanations for this are the concept of a primary carer, or um, the mother as the, uh, the key carer or client, and ideas and expectations of fathers, sometimes that they provide rather than care. Fathers' impact on mothers and their children now has a really strong evidence base that continues, yet acknowledging fathers' own experience of fatherhood can sometimes be a step too far removed from standard delivery, especially as fathers are not afforded a status in the perinatal period and are seen as supporters or a witness. But there are shifts and there has been a significant focus on this in the last 10 years. About eight years ago I appeared on BBC Breakfast with Mark Williams to talk about father's mental health and was instantly dragged around Twitter as a men's rights activist discounting women's experiences and told quite strongly that men just don't. Now every training session I do someone will mention male mental health and the message is getting through. This weekend, uh, Father's Day weekend, I read an emotive and crucial report of uh, PTSD following witnessing a traumatic birth from Elliot Ray from music, football and fatherhood. And it put me in mind of an ex-soldier I met about 12 years ago. He told me about the birth of his second child, how he thought he would lose both his wife and child and was left in a room on his own. He spoke of being scared to sleep once they were home, staying up to watch them both in case they left him again. He spoke to this emotional energy at that time, ranging from a constant panicky feeling to absolute terror, and he didn't know where to put it. But he knew that his place was to support her. He told me he would cook dinner with the radio up so no one could hear him cry. He told me that he would scrub his fingernails raw to ensure no germs got near his family. He told me that this was the first time he had spoke of this. And we both thought that was strange for different reasons. That the first time he talked about this was with a strange woman in a park who had asked a simple question. We didn't have the language to call it what it was then, but we know better now. Fathers have limited opportunities in the perinatal period because systems set up mothers as the main carer or client and a conduit of information to fathers. And in family services, this perspective can be institutionalized. This positions father as external rather than internal players. The lack of status coupled with the lack of systematic engagement of fathers further perpetuates father's internal language and rhetoric and script of illegitimacy that fathers can feel, 
that their experiences, including mental scarring, vivid recollections, helplessness, and acute anxieties are largely irrelevant, immaterial, and invalid, and worthy of suppression. When compared with the mother's experience, the it's not about me thought is common. And this marginalization of fathers can present four problems. It can suggest that fathers are optional in children's lives and don't contribute to the child's well-being. It's detrimental to mothers as it overburdens them with soul rather than shared responsibility. It dissuades take up and participation in services by fathers and pushes men to accept a diminished role in the life of families, such as going back to work two weeks after the baby is born. And it ignores fathers' lived experience, their mental health, their physical health, their biographical journey and neurobiological experiences. Chapter three explores in really good detail some of the issues fathers can face that can have an impact, including witnessing birth trauma, the link between maternal and paternal mental health. Uh, it's interesting to note that although fathers uh, may well be screened uh, for their mental health, it is uh, only when mothers have been flagged up. Um, biographical disruptions and transformation of everyday life such as acute change in identity, overwhelming feelings of responsibility, juggling work and home responsibilities, tiredness, lack of downtime, and the toil of excessive crying, the disconnection from friends and isolation, and of course, relationships and communication issues. And even when uh, fathers identify one factor as significant, most felt it was the way this had coincided with other aspects of the experience of becoming a father that explain their having become unable to cope. But these issues are hardly rare or unforeseen. We know they are coming and the transition to fatherhood can be turbulent. And it should be unsurprising that such challenges can have significant mental well-being implications. Although most fathers avoid significant mental illness, most will have faced some of these issues without societal support. Within the chapter, fathers do not blame health professionals for their lack of being prepared, which again speaks to the feeling of illegitimacy that mother and child should be the focus but many fathers acknowledge feeling on the margins, on the sidelines and unprepared for the transitions and challenges fatherhood would involve. Our 2018 report, Who's the Bloke in the Room, found that 94% of fathers attend at least one routine antenatal, uh, antenatal appointment, 99% are at an ultrasound and 98% are there during the labour. Yet 82% aren't asked about their mental health, 78% aren't asked about their physical health, 65% aren't talked with about their roles, and 56% aren't called by their name. Few fathers consider that having a baby may impact on their mental health, and it seems that no one had spoken with them about this, which often makes it harder for fathers to come to terms with things um, or I be able to identify them once they emerge. When asked what they'd wish they'd known, fathers often talk about being forewarned of the emotional upheaval, what signs to look for and how to prevent things getting worse. This can be thought of a lack of information or knowledge, this kind of forewarned is forearmed, and also a lack of support. Again, part of the marginalisation of fathers and their position as other rather than participants. Just last week, I delivered training to about 300 health and social care professionals. For many, this was the first time they had received any training around engaging fathers, and some had been in their role for over 30 years. Their views on what fathers are, what they do, and how and if they matter, were often based on assumptions developed over time from within a mother-focused service. They had not been afforded time to consider fathers well and had a default position of working with the mother-child dyad. Staff engage with a few fathers and mainly talk about the father if the mother raises the topic. 
if they did engage fathers, it was just often to support him, to support her, um, and not often acknowledging or reflecting father's own experience. And the default uh, deficit perspective can still loom large, that by default, fathers need to change, need help to be better by the very fact of their gender. And as I virtually now travel around the country talking to family services about fatherhood, I am cheered that many at least know about my postnatal depression. I'm pleased that the language is out there supported hugely by key individuals, researchers and charities. But there is still a disconnect between knowing about it and knowing what to do about it. Fathers continue to struggle to find support when and if they seek it or disclose. Some of these struggles may lie within the fear or stigma, their own interpretations of their struggles and repertoires of illegitimacy, which is one of the best titles of a, uh, a chapter of a book I've ever read. But when they do reach out, where is their experience validated? It's not found in a positioning of mother other model, which confounds their sense of illegitimacy or personal failure. It comes as no surprise to us that fathers are bypassing mainstream services, seeking support, either signalling or loudly shouting, kickstarting their own support systems, doing their own research, campaigning, reaching other fathers. And during the pandemic, dad's groups that have been delivered online have seen numbers hugely increase, in some cases from 10 to 600. The Lockdown Fathers report recently launched found that the pandemic and changes in work patterns is behind the increase in dads connecting with dads. Zoom etc makes the groups more accessible and the transformation of fathers engagement with the workplace makes the dads more available. We know that to achieve change we need new approaches from the top down and bottom up. And with that in mind, as well as lobbying for national level changes in policy and practice, we want to work with fathers, employers, schools, charities, local authorities to explore new ideas, uh, form pow powerful partnerships and trial interesting scalable approaches. And you can join us in this in our new campaign called Time with Dad. Becoming a father is one of life's big things. But the interplay between the extensive levels of personal investment on one hand and the awareness that they are not seen, their experiences not seen as valid, plays a significant role in struggles to interpret emotional difficulties as worthy of support. We will continue to support family services to not just widen their focus to include fathers, but to examine fathers' experiences and unpick the personal and structural barriers that holds back timely, crucial engagement and sometimes life-changing or life-saving support. We really welcome this book and the important dimensions and understanding it brings. And for International Fathers Mental Health Day, when we should all be asking, how are you, Dad? This book will help to ensure that practice and the wider society is ready for the answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I was so immersed in your words, I wasn't even looking at, at the clock. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I guess, you know, I guess the key, what I picked up from this is everybody's so complimentary about this fabulous book, but actually it seems to me it's a point in time, how timely it is that everybody is talking about this important area about father's role uh, and, and the book is just there waiting for people uh, to uh, grab it. So that's uh, really exciting. I can see there's a, a couple of questions here. Um, so, and I guess the other thing I was fascinated there just in terms of training and that there are people in practice who are still not thinking of fathers within the context of, of, of you know, of maternity services, which is, is quite surprising. Um, so we've got some questions down the side. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us today. We've got about 15 minutes, uh, which is great. And oh my goodness me, I can see some really long questions. I'm going to have to summarise them quite quickly. Or I might even get some people to ask their own questions if it seems uh, 
quite um, long. So uh, I want to uh, thank um, everybody here today who's been uh, a speaker. But let's move now to the uh, Q&A. Um, OK, so now bear with me while I read and talk at the same time. Uh, OK, I'm going to ask some quick ones first because I can I can read them uh, quicker. Uh, there's a question here in terms of methodologies, uh, in terms of what f the focus of your book. Uh, so other than interviews, did you also utilise online resources, blogs written by fathers as one of the sources of data as well? Quick question. I'm sure. Ranjana, Paul. Yeah, no, thank you for that. It was, it's a really good question because we were going to <laughs> at the start of the project. We we did have uh, the notion that we would we would sort of talk to fathers and that we would also try to do some sort of analysis of, of, of online social media content and so on. Um, uh, we eventually opted not to do that because we wanted to sort of focus upon the, the experiences from father's point of view. But I think what came out during doing so sort of illustrated to us why in this particular case, probably, although it would have been interesting, an analysis of online content wouldn't have sort of shown us all of the things that were actually going on for these fathers, because as we've said, that there was so much sort of sort of semi-coded or coded use of social media where, where, you know, if we were, for example, looking at sort of public content on Twitter, for example, or something of that kind, we simply wouldn't have picked up some of this coded content, which, which was sort of so laden with emotions. And, and yet, you know, we, you wouldn't sort of identify it if you were doing a sort of big search. I don't know if Ranjana wants to sort of add anything. Yeah, sorry, I was muted, uh, which is classically 2020, 2021. But no, just, just agreeing with Paul that uh, we definitely started out thinking we are going to do this broad thing and include in, include those elements. But then as the project evolved and our focus sort of really honed in on sort of trying to talk to people about the sort of broader pressures and structures and masculinities and so on, we ultimately settled on uh, interviews um, as the way ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And that gets a thumbs up for your response. So that's great. I'm going to go back to the top of the questions. And this it wasn't really a, a question from Vicky, who is a, one of our uh, colleagues at the University of Surrey. Um, but I do want to pick up on this because it was around um, training. And it's a bit about what Jasmine was just saying. And Vicky, can you say a little bit more about that? What kind of training as a midwife um, do we do? Yeah, so I mean, I've, I've been a midwife for 20 years myself and as an undergraduate student and as a, a working midwife, I have never done any training that focuses on fathers. It's never come up in our curriculum. However, um, taking over our, our perinatal mental health module as a tutor now, um, we do talk about fathers' mental health, although it is still fairly marginalised if we consider the whole module together and it's really you have uh, really made me reflect today on that actually um it's you know having uh i had quite you know poor perinatal mental health myself but also the impact that that had on my husband and my wider family um it's made me think that i would like to possibly add some more um and actually i saw your comment back ranjana about the fact that you've done something and i think it's really crazy that these things are happening and we're missing each other when actually there could be so much more collaboration going on. Um, it feels like a missed opportunity. Um, I do do some work with the with the psychology school um, as well. So I had one of the psychologists come and participate in our simulation day. But I would really, really be interested in hearing from either of you about how I could possibly put some sort of scenario into our simulation that actually um, deals with asking fathers questions. Um, particularly, I think, around um, birth trauma and bereavement, um, really, really significant. And we, I had a close family member recently that suffered a bereavement, and I have been very conscious to include um, the father in all of the conversations and making sure that everybody talks about both of them. But my sister has fed back to me that her husband is marginalised by all of their friends. Um, he is seen as this pillar of holding it all together and being strong for her. Um, and actually, you know, he really needs some support and he needs people to ask him questions. His friends, her friends have rallied around her, whereas his friends have all withdrawn. 
Um, and I don't really understand why that seems to happen, but it seems to be quite a common thing. So, yeah, I've got loads of my I'm firing on all cylinders at the moment because I've got so many notes that I've made. I really do. I'd love to have a meeting with you guys outside of this forum. Um, but, yeah, you know, there's some really great suggestions there. The practical um, application in practice of, you know, giving more time when we have a 10 to 15 minute appointment with our women and we're told that we have all of these questions that we have to ask and some of them are not appropriate to ask in front of the partner because they are things like domestic abuse screening etc um practically you know these things in there but i can already see the barriers um and you know parent education is practically non-existent now for all parents not just fathers but women too um the services that are there are pre-recorded remote access and I've got a serious issue with that on its own because it's a bit you know like if you haven't got access to the internet then we are um you know this it, the healthcare service really is at the moment um when it comes to you know antenatal education particularly and parent education um is geared up for people um that need it, need it the least because it's only those with money and finances and resources that can access it now um it's really quite poor so I mean, there's lots of challenges there and I don't really have any solutions in my head at the moment, but I'm, you know, more than happy to brainstorm with people. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to say that, yeah, anytime, we'd be happy to chat anytime. And, and we are currently sort of doing a variety of things. We're doing some CPD, uh, developing some CPD for NCT, who are our part other partners alongside the IHV on the Surrey Perinatal Project that's up there on the chat, if you want to have a look at it. Um, and um, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, ping us an email. I, I thought about NCT, but the problem with NCT is that they're not cheap and it's only parents that can afford it can access NCT. Um, and the parents that tend to need the antenatal education the most are those that can't afford to access it. So um, although it's, a, you know, it's an ideological that everyone would have something like the NCT, practically that's not the solution um and i yeah i just i would really like to to brainstorm about you know looking at some further um research or initiatives in the future if you ever decide to to go down that route then yeah we'll... i mean absolutely then city courses are, are are obviously for for specific people but no that's not what we are sort of uh, i just wanted to say that our that our eslc project is a partnership with ihv and the nct and uh, so we are working with both organizations equally and uh, part of what we've done for the nct actually um earlier on um uh, we, we've done some sort of focused work on sort of an evidence review of birth trauma and fathers particularly and um, the idea is, and, and there's another one, I think, on fathers and perinatal loss. And the idea is that these evidence reviews then feed onto the sort of the public facing free to use resources uh, that have nothing to do with the classes or anything, but, but just public resources. Uh, yeah. So those evidence reviews are currently up on our website if you wanted to uh, take a look. But yeah, ping yeah. us an email at any time to talk. Have a, definitely can have a look. I look forward to speaking to you both, hopefully both in the future. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you, Grace, for helping us with a question from Kieran. And Andy has um, offered to answer this question. It is in the chat, but thank you, Andy, for answering the question. If you could just give the context for it and uh, your response to it, that would be lovely. Absolutely, yes, thank you. And, and Kieran, re really sorry to hear the story. I think those who haven't seen the, the chat, just briefly, uh, essentially, uh, Kieran's partner, um, I think they're based in London, but Kieran's partner um, had to go down to Cornwall because her, her father is, is seriously unwell. Um, so, so they're apart at the moment. But one of the other key things that's come out of this as well is that Kieran now has, has subsequently found out that his, his partner has had quite significant pain before and after her C-section. And where can they get help? Absolutely can get help. Um, I think the best way that I can answer that is if you want to drop me um, a line, either through my social media, um, which is uh, at Dr Andy Mayers on Instagram and or, or, or Twitter, or, or maybe the facilitators here can, can share my email, happy with that. But essentially what I'll probably do is put you in touch with some of the people I already know, either at Make Birth Better, who are specifically there um, for supporting um, 
essentially birth trauma. But there's a number of other organisations that I've got in mind. There are people that can help both of you uh, negotiate what you've been through. Um, so please do reach out. Thanks for doing so. Uh, and we'll make sure you, you, you get signposted. Thank you, Andy. And um, thank you, Ranjana, for just posting in Andy's details there. And uh, Kieran, please do follow up on that. Uh, and, and thank you for that question. Um, I'm mindful that we've got about six minutes uh, left and there are um, more comments that relate to resources and pointing people to places they can find out more things. But I, And there's a question about methodology, but I'm just going to go up to one that's been posted by Annabelle Watson. Um, because what Annabelle is talking about here is what I've been thinking all of the time um, that we have been talking this morning. And that's really around the role of fathers in any kind of healthcare context. Um, and so let me just read you. Um, it's not really a question, it's more a comment. So I'm gonna leave it for people to think about. Um, I'll read it out. I'm writing up my thesis on life outcomes for children in care. I have noticed a lack of focus on men as capable primary caregiver and a lack of understanding of the mental health difficulties faced in fathers. As a result, we neglect to acknowledge that a father can be a sufficient caregiver and fathers are not given the time to demonstrate their care and ability before children enter care. It also means um, that the focus is on the mother's ability to meet the child's needs and often children enter care due to mother's failure to protect their children from an abusive father largely the only context where father mental health is mentioned. My project focuses on outcomes for those who are in care, but hopefully this is by research will inspire some policy research focus on situation fathers at the centre of parenting in family nurse partnerships and adult mental health services. So although not a question, thank you so much, Annabelle, because as a children's cancer nurse, I've been thinking all the time we're talking here, how often, um, certainly for me as a researcher, how often I'm saying to people, but we haven't asked the fathers about this. What is their role in either at the early diagnosis stage, later in therapy, in survivorship, wherever it is. So I think it's a really important point we're raising today in terms of fathers within the NHS and in other contexts of healthcare. So thank you, Annabelle, not a question, but a comment. And I think I just saw something else flash in. I'm just gonna to go to the bottom. Oh, there's something. Uh, Okay, so Alice, we have time for your question. Um, and this is really a methodological question, actually, to Ranjana uh, and Paul, which was around the interviews. How long did they last? Um, did they express any gratitude that you were asking about how they were mentally feeling? Uh, how did you manage their emotion? This is, so this is really about the method of talking to uh, fathers. Um, anything, Paul, Ranjana, you'd like to... Um, of course, it could be um, get a copy of the book and read the book if it's in there, um, but it might not be that straightforward. So please do take the time to answer that question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Paul can add stuff, I suppose. So the interviews in terms of how long they were, they were sort of a bit over an hour usually. Um, and um, we did a few in person, but largely they were online and we reflect in our book about why people may have chosen to do them online because this was very much pre pre pandemic so it's, it's, it had nothing to do with that but because of the subject matter uh, quite a bit has been written actually about people finding it a bit more private and secure to i don't know go up to a box room or something sometimes fathers did that from work uh, and and, and I, the fact that that choice existed for them i think really came to matter um, it, it, there's no doubt about it <clears throat> that the interviews were <clears throat> difficult and demanding in many ways. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I mean, a, a few of them definitely sort of felt able to open up and to talk, and all of them, I think, talked openly. Um, and one of the really useful things that Paul and I did that I think helped us also to do this sort of demanding fieldwork was Immediately after an interview, we'd, we knew we'd had the transcripts at some point, but immediately after an interview, we'd write our thoughts down as almost like field notes mm -hmm. and we'd send it to the other person. So one, so we divided up the interviews. He, he did some, I did some, but when he did an interview, he'd write his thoughts down immediately and send it to me and I'd do the same. And that 
I think that was important for us to sort of cope with the experience of field work, but that also became a really useful device to actually make sense of early findings that we found ourselves then going back to those field notes, which proved to be really valuable over and above just the transcripts themselves. So that's one of the things about the field work, the, the writing to each other that, that really sort of stands out for me. And over to you, Paul. No, I think that's great, Ranjana. I think you summarized it really well. I mean, that they were quite obviously sort of very emotional and, and uh, you know I think sort of talking to each other about them sort, sort of really helped um, and yeah and I suppose because they had sort of volunteered for a project that they knew was about this I suppose that suggests that they might have been more able to talk about it by that point at least than perhaps some other people would be and that's that's like a thing about the methodology that's interesting I suppose but um, but yeah and I mean they, they were I mean we were sort of overawed really by by how much they were prepared to to, to, to talk us through quite sort of deep, quite, and, un, 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 you know, sort of negative emotions and, and how they sort of cope with those. Thank you. Um, well, we are uh, 12.30, so we are out of time uh, and perfect on timing, um, everybody, in terms of your uh, contributions. I have so enjoyed this. Uh, I want to thank uh, Paul and Ranjana for undertaking the work in the first place and writing such a brilliant book, uh, which of course I have um, to add to my uh, collection uh, of books behind me. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm sure you've got a very busy day ahead of you on social media and busy and about. So thank you for giving up your time. Thank you for situating this here today. And Jasmina, thank you so much. Um, fascinating uh, to hear your work around uh, training. And um, let's hope this is the start of change, uh, whether that's uh, practice, uh, and policy, and I took the point that it's not just about practice, it's about changing policy, and, and maybe in the future, yes, uh, maternity services might well be called uh, something different as we reflect on the different participants, not just fathers, in maternity services. Thank you so much. Paul, Ranjana, anything else you wanted to say to close? Just a big thank you, I think. Thanks so much for coming, everyone, and thanks especially to, to you, Faith, and, and to all of the speakers. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Enjoy your days. Bye.